Well, well let's just contrast because what, what the average type one diabetic runs a, a hemoglobin A1C about it, what 8.3 or something like that. I can't remember what the number is, somewhere in there. What are these type one grit kiddos doing in adults that continue into that program? Where are they where do they tend tend to tend to run? They're, they're running the same I would say that they're running the same blood sugars as non-diabetics, but I'm concerned about the non-diabetic kids who are, you know, in mass developing type two right now. Mm -hmm. So most of the type one grit kids are probably as healthy as any of their healthy non-diabetic counterparts. And I'm talking uh, average blood sugars on their CGM 90 days around 85, 87, 83, 92, 100. If you see one of these parents who's got an average blood sugar around 102, They'll say, "Oh, I got, I have work to do. Yeah. You know, we have to, we have to switch to regular. We're still using the wrong kind of insulin or something." So your your blood sugar is going to be uh, if you if you follow the rules, and the rules are pretty clear. There, there's a lot of videos on, it and it's in the book, and a lot of people now know them and know and are helping other people. If you follow the rules, your yeah. blood sugar is going to be just the same as a healthy non-diabetic. Yeah. So not the average of 200 or 220, like you're talking about with that A1C of 8.3, but you know, an A1C of uh, below 5.0%. Dave's always been a below 5.0%. Yeah. Even in college, he went, he went away. His, his average blood sugar never got above a hundred. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. You know, and, and let's talk about, cause he's, an, he's, he, he was an athlete. I'm, I'm assuming still training, lifting, you know, hot, you know, eating yeah. a lot of food. I mean, you know, I'm just thinking about what I got to eat to maintain what I do. I eat a hell of a lot of food. I'm eating, you know, 300 grams of protein a day, something like that. So, I mean, if you get somebody like that, that's that, you know, they're not sick. They don't want to be sick. They want to be strong and robust right. and they want to eat, you know, a pound of steak and a meal or two pounds of steak and a meal or whatever it might be. How are those guys going to deal with this stuff? I mean, is it, what, what is the dosing? Like, let's say you eat, I know, I think Bernstein is what every, every two or three ounces is a unit of regular or something like that. What is the, what is the deal on that? Yeah. You, you're, uh, you're probably eating. Well, you might be eating what Dave was eating when he was a growing teenager in season, mm -hmm. because, you know, especially when football and basketball overlap during that one period. Right. So you're training three or four hours a day. So it's a it's a constant feed fest. Right. So you're you know, I'm buying those big uh, Costco loaves of, of of ribeyes and New York strips, you know, once every other day. That's what we're going through during season. It's it's uh, there's a lot of cooking to be done. Right. But in general. So. You know, um, the Bernstein rule is one ounce of regular, if you're not honeymooning, for two ounces of protein. So 22-ounce steak at a sitting is a pretty good chunk of food, and that's about 10 units of regular. Yeah, okay. Yeah, not, it's, not, it's a non-issue. We saw a kid on uh, social media the other day. His parents were, you know, he was probably an eight-year-old, and his parents were like, you know, take that diabetes, and he was eating uh, chocolate donuts with two spoons and the parent had 31 units of rapid insulin in him, which is like, you know, you know, death is on the table um, because that's so much insulin and you don't, it's totally unpredictable. So he, he went high later. It's nothing like, you know, eating a steak and uh, taking 10 units of rapid. There's just no comparison. The rapid, the lows occur so slowly, you know, like Dave will be playing Xbox on the couch and it's like, Dave, you know, you're 75. And then 15 minutes later, Dave, you're 72. And then he'll kind of walk over and, you know, get a half a glucose tab and then he'll be back up to 82 or something. You know, it's just totally different experience. Yeah. Yeah. That's a thing that uh, could, because most endocrinologists treating diabetes or even primary care, they're terrified of hypoglycemia. I mean, mm -hmm. and this is so they're, they'd rather you run high because we don't want the lows because, uh, obviously, the acute cry, you know, we you, you know, don't want you going into a, you know, diabetic coma. You don't want to, you know, you don't want to, uh, you know, there's some thought that, you know, chronic lows are associated with uh, dementia, things like that. So they 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 say, well, we're going to cheat on the high side and, and predispose you to blindness and amputations and heart disease and on right. and on and on. But exactly it's, right. it's interesting. You look at like the, the work of like uh, Newberg back in the 1920s, you know, treating type ones with basically, you know, low carb diets and they had very low very little instance of hypoglycemia despite the lack of carbs why do you think that is well if you if you're still making some insulin <clears throat> then you probably have enough communication with the alpha and beta cells that you could get a glucagon response to hypoglycemia so that may help you 
the but but in in general, and I, I can't comment on the the system in the 20s, but in general with the modern systems, the amount of insulin and how slow it's acting with the regular is such that you can overcome the downward trajectory of the the glucose with of the of the the blood glucose with uh, liquid glucose or even you know dry tabs. So what does that look like practically? We have a sugar bowl with dextrose, and I have a spoon in the sugar bowl, which at level is three grams. Dave uh, Dave's body weight. There's a chart in Bernstein's book. Dave's body weight is will raise him four points, uh, four milligrams per deciliter per gram. So if he has uh, one scoop, that's 12 points. So let's suppose Dave was 60. What would he do? Well, to get back to target and he was dropping, maybe we try to target like 90. That's 30 points. Okay. So you do the math and you say, okay, that's like two and a half scoops. And that's a conversation that occurs all the time in my house. Like, mom, I need a scoop. How many? Two. Okay. We'll get you this, you know, we'll get you the blood sugar. So there's, you know, there's still this 24. This is not a cure. We're on the ball uh, 24 seven. Dave has to wake up at night and take glucose or take insulin very frequently. So you, you, you still have to be, you know, and you, and it, less so, but you still have to be on the ball. But imagine being on ball, on the ball 24 seven, but losing all the time, how depressing that life would be. You know, I'm constantly struggling with my diabetes and now I've got gastroparesis. I can't get my blood sugar under control. Yeah, of course. And then they, and then they stand back and they go, why are these people depressed in, in mass? You know, we have to treat the depression and it's like, well, guess what happens if you, if you normalize your blood sugar, you, your depression drops to non-diabetic levels, Yeah. but they, but then they'll turn around and say, well, you'll be too depressed if you don't eat processed food. <laughs> I mean, it is, it is, it is in the world of type. I could talk to you for hours, Sean, about the stories. It is an, an, a madhouse with the, with the doctors, the industry, yeah. the, the, the professional charities. We went to a, Dave was a JDRF children's Congress rep from Hawaii. You should see the food that they give the kids. They give the kids all this food. We saw these, we sat at a table with two and three year old type one diabetics. You wouldn't believe how much carbohydrate these kids are, are eating that was available to them. And sure enough, you know, about a half an hour into the presentation, you've got a ballroom full of four or 500 children with, with all their parents, the symphony of CGM alarms going off from high blood sugars was nauseating. And I think, you know, Dave and I still have kind of like a PTSD. I mean, we still talk about that. You know, this was almost eight years ago. We went there, but it was just on the carnage that we saw and the future that you knew that these kids would have. It was astonishing. The advice that they were given, astonishing. 